In the early hours of November 15, 2004, at Broccoli Drive in Bethlehem, New York, 52-year-old Peter Porco and his 54-year-old wife, Joan Porco, were sound asleep in their bedroom, completely unaware of impending tragedy. When morning came, Peter was found lifeless at the bottom of the staircase by his co-worker, Michael Hart, while Joan was in critical condition in their bedroom upstairs. Both had been attacked multiple times with an axe. The investigation into the attack took many unexpected turns, involving multiple suspects and even raising suspicions within the family itself. The community was captivated by the case, wondering who the killer could possibly be. However, the police had their own strategies in place. Who was responsible for the violent attack on Peter and Joan Porco? What were the motives behind the crime? And what evidence led the police to the eventual suspect? Today we'll take a look into the disturbing case of Peter Porco. Without further ado, let's get started. Bethlehem is a town located in a beautiful region of the United States. It is known for its vibrant community and rich history. With its picturesque landscapes, rolling hills, and tranquil atmosphere, Bethlehem is a haven for outdoor enthusiasts. Its close proximity to major cities like Albany adds to its appeal, making it a desirable place to live and visit. But this beautiful town was witness to a violent crime on November 14, 2004. Peter Porco was born on August 22, 1952, in Norwalk, Connecticut. He grew up with his parents, Ralph and Jane Porco. In the 70s, during his time at the University of Albany, studying law, Peter crossed paths with Joan Balzano, who was studying speech therapy and also worked in a local school. They fell in love and soon decided to tie the knot. They settled in Bethlehem, New York, on Broccoli Drive. The pair had been married for 30 years by the early 2000s. In 2004, Peter, at 52 years old, worked as an appellate division court clerk, while Joan was a dedicated children's speech pathologist. Both were active in their church, but Joan's devotion to her family was unmatched. Together they had raised two sons, Jonathan, 23 years old, and Christopher, 21 years old. They also had a dog, a golden retriever, who was also a member of the family. Jonathan was serving time in the U.S. Navy, stationed on a powerful nuclear submarine. Meanwhile, Christopher was pursuing his studies in biomedical engineering and economics at the University of Rochester, not too far from their family home. The Porco family appeared to be living a happy and successful life in their charming old house. However, one fateful November morning, everything changed. Little did anyone know, there was a mysterious secret lurking beneath the surface, waiting to be revealed. It was still dark in the early morning of Monday, November 15, 2004, when the alarm clock beside Peter Porco's bed began to ring. Peter woke up and reached over to turn off the alarm, so as not to disturb his sleeping wife, Joan, who was beside him. As he got out of bed, Peter felt a chill in the air so he quickly put on a sweater before making his way down the hallway to the main bathroom. Peter stood at the vanity mirror, where he looked at his reflection. He was all covered in blood. His face appeared different. Strangely, he didn't seem to be concerned or disturbed by it, as if he was not fully aware of his surroundings. Despite this, Peter continued with his usual morning routine. He picked up his toothbrush and began brushing his teeth, just as he did every day. Even as he continued, the presence of blood remained noticeable. After finishing, he left the brush in the sink and proceeded downstairs to the kitchen to start preparing for work. Along the way, he left traces of blood wherever he walked. Despite this strange occurrence, Peter went about his task sorting through the mail, unloading the dishwasher, and getting food from the refrigerator, making his breakfast. While Peter continued his morning routine, he saw the presence of blood droplets that seemed to appear everywhere he went, but he wasn't bothered at all. He stepped outside to retrieve the daily newspaper from the front porch. Unfortunately, as he reached for it, the front door unexpectedly closed and locked behind him, leaving Peter locked out of his own home. Thankfully, he knew there was a spare key hidden under a flower pot nearby. As he retrieved the key and used it to re-enter the house, he saw larger droplets of blood on the porch steps. After leaving the key in the lock, and allowing the door to close slightly, Peter took a few steps back towards the kitchen. However, his condition suddenly deteriorated, 
causing him to lose consciousness and collapse at the bottom of the staircase. Peter, known as a gentle-natured man, was a reliable worker at the courthouse and never missed a shift without notifying his colleagues. Therefore, when he didn't show up for work on November 15, 2004, without any explanation, his colleagues grew worried. It started off as any other day until Peter Porco didn't show up for work, and people began to get worried because that wasn't like him. They tried calling the Porco family home, but no one answered. Concerned, Peter's co-worker, Michael Hart, decided to visit Peter's house to check on him. Michael drove to the quiet and peaceful Broccoli Drive and parked in front of the two-story Porco residence. From the outside, everything seemed normal. Michael attempted to call Porco's home number twice but received no response. He then contacted his boss, who suggested that he go up and knock on the front door. As Michael approached the house and knocked, he quickly realized that something was not right. As Michael stood outside the house, he could hear the Porco's golden retriever barking from inside the house. Curiosity got the better of him, and he cautiously looked inside. What he saw left him stunned, as if he had seen something incredibly frightening. In a panicked voice, Michael told his boss that it was a crime scene and urged him to call an ambulance. Without wasting a moment, he dialed 911 to report what he had discovered. When the police arrived at the scene, they encountered a horrifying sight that no one could have imagined. He looks down and he sees on the cement steps some drops of blood. Peter Porco's lifeless body lay at the bottom of the stairs, motionless on the tiled floor. He had suffered a devastating blow to his head, resulting in severe trauma. Shockingly, half his skull was missing, exposing his brain. His jaws had been removed and his eyes were open and lifeless. Blood from the severe head injury had soaked his clothes and was splattered across the walls and some interior doors. It was a scene of shocking horror, something that most people who saw it find it difficult to talk about. As the police investigated the crime scene, red footprints stained with blood led through the area, forming a line. This discovery indicated that someone had walked through the blood, leaving behind a chilling trail. What made it even more horrifying was the realization that Peter, despite the severity of his injuries, had not died immediately. He had remained conscious after the attack, still aware of his surroundings and the familiar routine of his morning. Paramedic Kevin Robert was on duty, driving his ambulance nearby, when he received a distressing call about an unfolding situation on Broccoli Drive. He immediately rushed to the Porco's house and was directed to the first floor by Detective Chris Bowdish, who had arrived a few minutes earlier. Carefully maneuvering around Peter's lifeless body, Kevin and Detective Bowdish made their way upstairs to the main bedroom. Inside, they encountered a horrifying scene. Joan Porco was found lying flat on the bed that was covered in blood. The walls and bedside tables were also stained with blood splatter. Joan had cuts and wounds on her upper arms and hands, which suggested that she had tried to defend herself during the attack. However, her head had suffered the most severe injuries. One of her eyes was split in half, and the side of her jaw was hanging loose from her face. The sight was deeply disturbing. Investigators could see her brain while they were trying to save her life. She was also hit with the axe along her arms. An axe covered in blood was found at the foot of the bed, and the police believed it to be the murder weapon. Peter had been attacked with the same axe, sustaining 16 blows to his head, which was 13 more than his wife. This suggested that Peter was the intended target. Shockingly, Joan Porco, despite her injuries, was still alive and conscious. Even though she couldn't speak, she found a way to communicate with Detective Bowdish through nods and hand gestures. I said to her, can you hear me? And she shook her head visibly up and down in the yes notion that she could. The officer asked her if she knew who attacked her. Sensing that Joan's condition might worsen and she could pass away any time, Bowdish began questioning Joan to gather crucial information. In order to determine if the perpetrator was a family member or someone else, Bowdish asked if a family member was responsible for the attack, and Joan nodded in agreement. Having already spoken to Michael, Peter's co-worker, Bowdish knew that Porcos had two sons. When he specifically mentioned Jonathan, Joan indicated that he was not involved. However, Bowdish then asked about her younger son, Christopher Porco. 
I asked her, did Christopher do this to you? And she clearly, again, nod her head up and down, yes. Joan nodded to confirm his involvement. Detective Bowdish double-checked the question, and Joan's response remained the same. The information provided by Joan was significant, leading the police to focus their investigation on their first suspect, Christopher. Joan was swiftly taken to the hospital for a lengthy surgery, and Peter's body was sent for a thorough autopsy. Meanwhile, the police continued to examine the entire crime scene. Initially, the police considered the possibility of robbery as a motive for the crime. However, they found that nothing had been stolen from the house, except for some drawers that were removed, but nothing had been taken from them. In the dining room, Joan's purse and its contents were found untouched. Detective Bowdish believed that this indicated that the involvement of someone from within the Porco family or someone with access to the house. There was no evidence to support this theory. Upon examining the entire crime scene, the police did not find any fingerprints besides those of Peter and Joan. Amongst all the confusion, a question that puzzled everyone was how Peter was able to continue with his morning routine after sustaining 16 axe hits. The answer to this question came with the results of Peter's autopsy. The autopsy reports showed that Peter's brain had suffered extensive damage in the attack. The upper part of his brain, called the neurocortex, responsible for higher functions like thinking, language, and reasoning, was severely affected. However, the lower part of his brain, known as the paleocortex, which controls primal instincts and habitual behaviors, remained intact. This explains how Peter was able to get up and perform his morning routines, even though he was gravely injured and almost half dead. His basic instincts and ingrained habits allowed him to carry out familiar tasks without conscious thought. The news of Peter and Joan Porco's murder quickly spread, capturing the attention of many. A reporter from the Times Union contacted Christopher, who was in Rochester, New York at the time, and informed him about the attack on his parents. Christopher was taken aback and confused, as it was the first he had heard of the incident. He asked the reporter for more information, but she couldn't provide any details and promised to call him back. Christopher anxiously awaited for the phone to ring in his dorm room, but it remained silent. Finally, he gathered himself and decided to reach out to the local police near his parents' home to find out what had truly happened. Hi, uh, my name is Chris Porco. I was just called by the Times Union saying that my parents were found dead this afternoon. Um, I was wondering if you had any information for me. Hey, Chris, sorry, some... what about Saria? I'm at school in Rochester, New York. Okay, you're at... in Rochester? Yes. Okay. Do you have a phone number there, Chris? Yeah, I sure do. Um, 585-274. Okay, are, are, are you in a dorm there? Yes, I am. Okay. Do you have a dorm name or...? Um, it's called Monroe. Okay. Is there a room number there? Uh, okay. And you're hearing from the Times Union? Yeah, they called me and said my, my parents were found, um, I guess, I don't know, they didn't say how or anything. Okay. I'm going to try and find you somebody you can talk to. I'm not quite sure who's in the office, but let me try and find you somebody who may have some more information for you. Thank you and you'll very just much. hang on the line for me, okay? Thank you. Chris? Yes. Okay, one of my detectives is out on the road right now, Detective Rudolph. Okay. We're going to have him call you back momentarily, okay? Thank you very much. Let me just confirm your phone number, 585? Yes. 274? Yes. That's correct. Okay, you'll be expecting a call from Detective Rudolph. He's going to give you a call right back, okay? Thank you very much. Bye-bye. After some time, Detective Rudolph called Christopher back and delivered the heartbreaking news that his father had been killed and his mother was in the hospital. Christopher was already preparing to come back to see his parents when he received the call. However, due to some reception issues, the call got disconnected, and Detective Rudolph asked Christopher to come to the police station to continue the conversation. Hi, I'm calling back uh, Detective, um, I don't remember his name. I was on the phone with him a minute ago, told me to call you back. Okay, your name? Uh, Chris Borco. Hold on one second. Thank you. Hey, Chris? Yes. Yeah, okay, that's better. I don't have the static anymore. Um, okay, so now who's bringing you down? Uh, my uncle John is my mother's brother. What's his last name? Uh, Belzano. B-A-L-Z-A-N-O. Okay. 
it, or is it just the two of you that are going to be coming to, coming down? As, as far as I know, yes. Okay. Uh, now, as far as when was the last time you said you came down and saw your parents? Uh, about three weeks ago. I, it was on the weekend. Um, I can give you a day. I have to, I have to figure it out. I'm not really sure. Okay, but about three weeks ago. Yeah. Okay, and the email. What, what's going on with your email? You said you um, you, well, you emailed him today, but you didn't get a, a response. Well, yeah, I, I emailed him this afternoon. Uh, my dad at work. Okay. Um, about uh, college loan stuff. About what? College loan stuff. Oh, about college loans. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Let me just. So you will be here probably. You're gonna go right to Albany Med. Uh, I don't know. I don't even know where my mom is. But. Yeah, she is at Albany Med. Okay. Do, do you know her condition? Uh, in... No, because I haven't talked to her. Let me give you my pager number. Okay. Um... So when you get there, I'll come and see if there's anything I can do for you. Okay. Four two two. Mhm. Well, and you're gonna have a cell phone, right, or your uncle's cell phone? Yeah. All right, let me give you my cell phone also, just in case. Okay. Oh, it is 788? Mm hmm 788. Right. Okay. All right? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yep. All right, bye. Christopher asked about his mother's condition, but there was absolutely no concern in his voice. Normally, a child would panic upon hearing something like this, but Christopher didn't seem concerned. His uncle John Balzano picked him up from campus and drove him to Bethlehem, which was a nearly four-hour journey. Paramedics tried their best to save Joan Porco, but they struggled to place an oxygen mask over her face due to her injuries. When Christopher arrived at the hospital, Joan was undergoing surgery. He was greeted with hugs from friends and relatives who had gathered in the waiting room. Shockingly, a family friend informed Christopher that he was a suspect in the attack. Christopher couldn't believe that anyone would think he could harm his own parents. He was then approached by Detective Bowdish, who wanted to talk to him, and he agreed to go to the police station for questioning. During the interrogation, Christopher remained polite and cooperative. He told the police that he had been periodically visiting his parents, but hadn't stayed with them for three weeks. He strongly denied any involvement in the attack and provided an alibi for the night of the incident. Your mother is communicating. She's saying you were there at the house. You don't know why she would say that. She knows what happened. I hope she does. I was not there. Christopher explained that he went out to dinner with a friend in Rochester at 9.30 p.m. and returned to his on-campus dormitory afterward. He spent the evening exchanging online messages with his girlfriend, Sarah Fisher, and watching a movie in the dormitory common room until he fell asleep on the sofa. Christopher willingly allowed the police to take his fingerprints and blood for testing. He even lifted his shirt to let them check for any superficial injuries that might indicate his involvement in the attack. He provided his clothing for analysis, and his yellow Jeep was also examined, but investigators found no evidence linking him to the crime. Also, no traces of blood or fingerprints belonging to anyone other than Peter and Joan were found at the crime scene. Strangely, the murder weapon, the axe, did not have any fingerprints on it. Investigators could not find any evidence that connected Christopher to the attack. After being questioned for six hours, Christopher was allowed to leave the police station, as there was no solid evidence against him. He went back to the hospital to see his mother, Joan, who had undergone a 12-hour surgery and was in a medically induced coma. Miraculously, three weeks later, Joan woke up from the coma. Everybody was very surprised. It was a miracle. She obviously had a strong will to, to live, and the doctors just did an, an amazing job. Joan had suffered severe injuries in the attack, including the loss of her left eye, a portion of her skull being removed, and permanent scarring on her face. Her voice was also affected, and she could only speak in a quiet whisper. Against all odds, Joan miraculously managed to survive, despite the severity of her injuries. However, a significant issue arose, as Joan had no memory of the night of the attack. She could recall her activities leading up to that day, such as working in the yard and going to church, but had no recollection of the night of November 15, 2004. It seemed as though fate was protecting the identity of the attacker. Most importantly, Joan couldn't remember identifying Christopher as her attacker, and denied ever doing so. In her heart, she believed Christopher to be innocent. 
Once Joan unequivocally stated that Christopher had no involvement in the attack, the police were compelled to stop looking at him as a suspect. With Joan's denial and support for her son's innocence, the investigators had no choice but to eliminate Christopher as a suspect in Peter and Joan's murder. I am absolutely positive that my son was in no way involved in this heinous crime. I implore the district attorney's office to leave my son alone and to search for Peter's real killer. This led police to redirect their attention towards other evidence and potential suspects in their quest to solve the case. The police discovered that Peter Porco had received a serious threat from a man named Patrick De Lucia, who had lost custody of his children before the New York State Supreme Court, where Peter had worked. Peter took the threat seriously and decided to protect himself by keeping a handgun next to his bed. However, as time passed without any further incidents, Peter felt less concerned and eventually stored the gun away in a closet, thinking that the threat had passed. The man told him he was going to get a gun and he was going to come and kill the judge and Peter Porco. The police strongly believed that Patrick, who had threatened Peter, was waiting for the perfect moment to carry out his revenge. On the night of November 15, 2004, they suspected that he attacked Peter and Joan to fulfill his vendetta. Without wasting any time, the police located and extensively questioned Patrick about his whereabouts during the attack. However, Patrick had a solid alibi that proved he was not involved. With no other evidence or reasons to connect him to the crime, the police ruled him out as a suspect. It was at this point that they received information about an anonymous letter, which could provide new leads in the investigation. An envelope containing a white powder was delivered to the headquarters of the Times Union newspaper in Albany, a city north of Del Mar. When a staff member opened it, a white powder spilled out from one of the corners. The staff quickly contacted the police about the suspicious package. Inside the envelope was a letter from someone confessing the murder of Peter Porco. Peter Porco was not even a challenge. Once I got inside, I repeatedly hit him in the head and neck with a small axe I brought with me. I ignored all his pleading screams. Also, I beat Joan Porco, but unfortunately, she survived. If you ever want to find me, you might want to stop going after easy suspects. Show me some respect I deserve. Catch me if you can. The letter was a significant lead in the investigation, but the police had doubts about its authenticity. They questioned why a killer would willingly come forward and advised the police not to focus on easy suspects. It seemed as though someone wanted to divert the attention of the investigation towards serial killers, potentially hiding their own involvement. The police had to carefully consider the motives and credibility of the letter while continuing their search for the truth. The police couldn't find out where the letter came from, even after conducting tests. They found that the white powder was harmless and couldn't uncover any fingerprints or clues that could lead them to the person behind it. A police lieutenant, when asked about the letter, shared that he didn't consider it a breakthrough in the case, but rather viewed it as another intriguing path they were exploring. However, the lieutenant did not disclose that the police had already concluded that the letter was a hoax. They focused their attention on solid suspects, who may have had a motive to kill Peter. During the investigation, it was discovered that Peter had an unexpected connections to the criminal underworld, as his uncle Frank Porco was a known mobster in New York. Thirty years before the attack on Peter and Joan, Peter's uncle Frank had attended their wedding wearing expensive jewelry and carrying a gun. There were rumors that Frank had betrayed his fellow mobsters, and Peter knew about this and was about to take action against him. This led some to speculate that Peter and Joan could have been targeted as revenge. This theory gained traction because the attacker had used an axe, and Frank was known as Frankie the Fireman because he had killed two people with an axe in the past. It was what they call a signature killing, you know, that the mob would do and it was a fireman's act because it was retaliation for Frankie the fireman. However, further investigation revealed that the axe used was not a fireman's axe, but a regular one from Peter's garage, which they had purchased from a local hardware store. He was in prison because he wasn't a snitch. You know, he had been made de offers to cooperate with the authorities to avoid prison, and he didn't, so he ended up in prison. Additionally, Frankie was already in prison for being a loan shark. There were also rumors that Frankie might cooperate with authorities 
and provide information in exchange for a reduced sentence. However, a background check on Frankie debunked this theory. Throughout the investigation, it was confirmed that Frankie was in federal prison during the attack on Peter. This meant that he couldn't have been the one responsible for the crime. With all the suspects eliminated, the police found themselves back at the beginning of their search. They were frustrated because they didn't have any strong evidence or leads that could point them towards the real killer. It was a challenging situation for the investigators as they had to regroup and find a new direction. The police started to wonder if they had overlooked any important details in the case. A nagging feeling crept into their minds. Were they missing something right in front of them? Could there be a vital clue hidden in the past of the Porco family? Determined to uncover any overlooked details, they decided to thoroughly investigate the history of the Porco family. They wanted to learn everything about their past, hoping to uncover any information that could provide valuable clues and help solve the mystery of the crime. They discovered that two years prior, in 2002, Peter had reported a burglary. It appeared that someone had broken into their house by breaking the window in the garage and stealing Peter's laptops. During their examination of the house on November 15, 2004, they found a window in the garage that was slightly open and had a cut screen. However, when they tried to open it further, they couldn't because Peter had installed bolts in the window frame to secure it. The window was only open about four inches, making it impossible for anyone to enter through it. This meant if the attacker had entered the house, it must have been through the front door. Surprisingly, the police discovered that it was Christopher who had stolen the laptops back in 2002. On November 28, 2002, while Christopher was at home for the Thanksgiving holiday, someone broke into the Porco home and stole two of Peter's laptops. Then on July 21, 2003, another time when Christopher was staying at home, another burglary occurred. Joan's laptop and other electronics were stolen. This raised suspicions and led the police to develop a theory linking Christopher to the burglaries. The police discovered that Christopher had an eBay account. They found evidence that all the stolen items had been sold using that account. To confirm their suspicions, they traveled to San Diego and recovered Joan's stolen laptop from the person who had purchased it. It turned out that Christopher not only used the eBay account to sell the stolen items, but also to scam people. His scam involved selling an item on eBay, receiving payment then posing as his older brother, Jonathan, and deceiving buyers by claiming that Christopher had passed away. This made it difficult, especially at that time, for the buyers to receive their purchased product or get a refund. This information became crucial in the investigation of the attack on Peter and Joan. Christopher was once again the focus of the police's attention. It was clear that Christopher was not as innocent as he claimed to be, and the detectives were determined to gather all the relevant information about him. They believed that there was more to the story than what initially appeared, and they wanted to reveal the complete truth behind the attack on Peter and Joan. The police learned that Christopher had been facing some academic challenges. While his parents had high hopes for his success at the University of Rochester, Christopher seemed more focused on having fun rather than studying. Christopher's poor grades led to his expulsion from the university and suspension after the fall of 2003. His parents tried to encourage him to follow in his brother Jonathan's footsteps and join the Reserve Officers Training Corps program, which would provide a scholarship for his Navy service. Christopher adamantly denied that his academic troubles were not his fault. He claimed to his parents that he was unjustly expelled because of a particular professor. However, the situation was odd because typically students receive warnings and offers of assistance before they are ultimately suspended for poor performance. It is common for universities to provide students with second chances to improve their grades and academic standing. Christopher relied on the hope of second chances. He decided to give it another shot by enrolling at Hudson Valley Community College in the spring of 2004 believing that success there would pave the way for his return to the University of Rochester. Unfortunately, history repeated itself, and Christopher failed once again. During his visit to England as a part of his parents' study abroad program, he received an email from his mother, Joan, expressing her disappointment and scolding him 
for failing his classes at Hudson Valley Community College. You just left, and I can't believe my eyes. I look at your interim grade report. You know what they say. Three strikes and you're out. Explain yourself. However, Christopher chose not to respond to the email, leaving his parents furious and deeply concerned about his well-being. While he enjoyed his time in England, he eventually settled down to write a response to his father, Peter. In his message, Christopher confidently blamed the college registrar for their incompetence and for messing things up. He admitted to making a mistake and receiving a low grade of C on a test, but he assured his father that he shouldn't worry because he would take care of everything once he got home. However, Christopher's actions contradicted his words when he returned from England as he decided to lie to his parents once again. Christopher told his parents that he had successfully been readmitted to the University of Rochester. He lied saying that the university had made a mistake by wrongly grading one of his finals, which had significantly impacted his overall grade. Fortunately, the error was discovered, and the university was in the process of rectifying the situation. As a result, Christopher would be able to return to his studies, and the university would cover the cost of his tuition for the semester to compensate for the troubles they had caused him. Peter and Joan were relieved after listening to this, and they believed that Christopher would be able to continue his studies at the University of Rochester as they had hoped. They prepared and sent him back to the university, expecting him to complete his semester there. However, the truth was quite different from what they believed. In reality, the university had never requested Christopher to return, nor did they offer to cover his tuition. So how did he manage to get back in? Christopher took matters into his own hands by forging transcripts from the community college. He created fake records that made it appear as though he had successfully completed several semesters with excellent grades, thus making him eligible to return to the University of Rochester. Unaware of the deception, the university accepted these fraudulent transcripts and allowed Christopher back into their institution. However, Christopher faced a challenging situation when it came to paying for his tuition. He couldn't approach his parents for money because he had already misled them by claiming that the university would cover his expenses. One might think he would take the responsible route and work hard at a part-time job, saving up enough money to pay for his tuition himself but Christopher had other plans. He chose the path of deception once again. He approached his parents and asked them for their financial information and a co-signature to secure a loan of $2,000. Christopher took the financial information and co-signed loan documents to Citibank, but instead of borrowing just $2,000, he deceived his parents by forging Peter's signature and obtaining a loan of $31,000. With this money he paid for his tuition, as planned. However, Christopher's deceptive actions didn't end there. Shortly after, he once again forged his father's signature to finance the purchase of a flashy, bright yellow Jeep Wrangler, allowing him to indulge in the luxurious lifestyle he had always desired. Everything seemed to be going smoothly for Christopher, until Citibank contacted Peter to discuss repayment of the loans, alerting him to the fraudulent transactions. The call came as a shock to Peter, as he discovered the significant amount of money that had been taken out in his name, including the $16,000 loan Christopher supposedly co-signed for the Jeep Wrangler. He thought that Christopher wanted a $2,000 loan, as he had said, but all this additional information made him furious. Filled with anger and frustration, Peter repeatedly tried to reach out to Christopher, but his son avoided his calls and did not respond to him. Unable to contain his anger any longer, Peter decided to write an email to Christopher, delivering a strong warning and even threatening legal action, which left Christopher with a final chance to face the consequences of his actions. I want you to know that if you abuse my credit again, I will be forced to file forgery affidavits in order to disclaim liability, and that applies to the Citibank College loan. If you attempt to reactivate it or use my credit to obtain any other loans, I have to take legal actions against you. Christopher chose not to respond to the email, and he stopped contacting his parents, adding to their growing concern and worry. They became increasingly troubled about his well-being. Just seven days before the devastating attack on Peter and Joan, Joan reached out to Christopher in an email, expressing her genuine concern for his mental state. 
she lovingly urged him to contact them, emphasizing their unconditional love and their desire for his success and happiness in life. However, it was tragically ironic that Christopher returned home only after his father's death and the horrifying incident that unfolded. The investigation took a surprising turn when detectives discovered that Peter and Joan Porco had life insurance policies worth a staggering $1 million, and after their death all the money of the policy would directly go to their sons. However, what raised suspicions further was Christopher's recent visit to a financial counselor just a month before the attack in October 2004. This raised many crucial questions. Where was Christopher expecting such a massive amount of money to come from? Could it be related to the insurance policies? Did money serve as a motive for Christopher to harm his own father? With these questions lingering, the police made their way to the University of Rochester, hoping to find the answers they were seeking. The police determined to find out where Christopher was on the night of the crime. They decided to question the students in his dorm, Monroe, to gather information. Surprisingly, every single one of them, including his fraternity brothers, stated that Christopher was not with them that night. They shared that they had a movie night in the lounge where almost everybody in the building gathered to watch the film, Shrek 2, until the early hours of the morning, around 3.30 a.m. It was a fun and memorable night for everyone except for Christopher, who was noticeably absent. The students even tried to call him, but he was nowhere to be found in his room or the entire dormitory. An unexpected turn in the investigation occurred when Christopher's friend, Jason, stepped forward with crucial information. He revealed that Christopher had told him he needed to meet his sick aunt, which is why he couldn't join the movie night. Christopher also mentioned parking his muddy Jeep behind the dorm. This revelation raised a pressing question. Who was this aunt that Christopher claimed to meet? Curiously, Christopher didn't have any aunts living near his dorm or in Bethlehem. It became evident that Christopher's alibi of sleeping on the couch the entire night was a complete lie. He was intentionally trying to mislead the police and divert their investigation. The burning question remained, where did Christopher actually go on that fateful night? The police reviewed surveillance footage from the campus. To their surprise, four cameras captured a yellow Jeep Wrangler leaving the campus at 10.30 p.m. on the night of November 14, 2004 the exact time Christopher claimed to be asleep on the couch. The Jeep returned the following morning around 8.30 a.m., just hours after the attack on November 15, 2004. This raised pressing questions about where Christopher had been for such an extended period and where he had gone. The police decided to pursue their leads and headed to the toll booths between Albany and Rochester. If Christopher had passed through these toll booths, it would strongly indicate that he had indeed visited the Porco home that fateful night. Their primary focus was the first toll booth encountered when leaving from Rochester. I don't believe that those lanes are surveilled with video cameras. The investigation took an intriguing turn as the police questioned the toll booth operators. John Fallon, a toll collector at the first toll booth, vividly remembered handing a toll ticket to a young man driving a yellow Jeep Wrangler with impressive tires at 10.45 p.m. on November 14, 2004. As a passionate fan of Jeeps, John couldn't help but admire the vehicle. The detectives then proceeded to the second targeted toll booth on the way to Albany. There, Karen Russell, a toll collector located nine miles from the Porco's home and 228 miles from Christopher's dorm, recalled a young man with brown hair zooming into her lane at exit 24 in Albany around 1.51 a.m. Astonishingly, at 5.15 a.m., she spotted the same yellow Jeep making its way back towards Rochester as it passed her toll booth. But there was also one other person who had seen the yellow Jeep. In the early hours of November 15, 2004, at 4 a.m., as darkness enveloped the neighborhood, Marshall Gokey, a local resident, prepared to leave for work. As he turned on the car's headlights, the bright beams illuminated his neighbor's property, revealing a striking sight, a yellow Jeep Wrangler parked in the driveway. This sighting of the Jeep in Porco's driveway at the time of the attack proved to be a crucial piece of evidence for the detectives. Remarkably, the timing of the Jeep's departure from the campus, its passage through the toll booth, 
and its presence at the Porco's home align perfectly with the timeline of the attack. The pieces of the puzzle were finally coming together, pointing towards a shocking revelation. Based on the evidence and eyewitness testimonies, the police constructed a timeline of the attack and how it was carried out. According to their investigation, Christopher departed the campus in his yellow Jeep around 10.30 p.m. on the fateful night of November 14, 2004. He smoothly passed through the first toll booth, leaving Rochester at approximately 10.45 p.m. and entered Albany around 1.51 a.m. Upon arriving at the Porco's residence, he discreetly accessed the house using a spare key, cleverly hidden beneath a pot near the front door, and after opening the door, he carefully returned it to its hiding spot afterward. Inside, his first task was to deactivate the burglar alarm using the master code, which only a family member would possess. During the meticulous examination of the crime scene on the day of the attack, investigators had made a chilling discovery. The burglar alarm had been forcefully smashed, but curiously it had already been deactivated around 2.14 a.m. The time of deactivation was stored in a box in the basement, a detail that Christopher likely wasn't aware of. After deactivating the alarm, he proceeded to the garage where he obtained an axe, the murder weapon. With the axe in hand, he quietly made his way upstairs to Peter and Joan's room. In a horrifying act, he launched a violent attack on Peter, striking him 16 times with the axe. The disturbing sound of the attack awakened Joan, who was startled and horrified as she witnessed Christopher's horrifying attack on her husband. Despite Joan's attempt to save herself, Christopher was determined to leave no evidence or witness behind. He viciously attacked Joan three times with the axe, targeting her head, believing that she would eventually succumb to her injuries by morning. He then went downstairs and deliberately smashed the burglar alarm and cracked the garage window to create the illusion that someone had broken into the house through the window, making it appear like a burglary gone wrong. However, Christopher was unaware that Peter had already secured the windows with bolts, making it impossible for anyone to enter. After meticulously cleaning himself and removing all traces of blood and fingerprints from the house, Christopher severed the phone line at 4.54 a.m., ensuring there would be no means of communication. In this way, he sought to eliminate any possible witnesses or evidence that could link him to the crime. With his plan carefully executed, Christopher swiftly departed from the Porco's house, and at 5.12 a.m., he re-entered the New York State Thruway, heading back towards Rochester. As the morning progressed at around 8.30 a.m., the cameras on the roof of a medical center captured a yellow Jeep Wrangler traveling in the direction of the campus. The timeline of events aligned perfectly, adding to the mounting evidence against Christopher as the prime suspect in the crime but the investigators encountered a twofold challenge, firstly determining whether the yellow Jeep truly belonged to Christopher or not. Seeking assistance, they turned to video analysis James Kennedy, a master of unraveling mysteries captured on surveillance cameras. With his expertise, he processed the security camera footage using advanced computer filters. So it's not like our filtering software all of a sudden makes this stuff appear. What it does, it provides us with, in some cases, subtle, in some cases, dramatic clarifications. As James Kennedy carefully examined the footage, he made intriguing discoveries about the yellow Jeep. He noticed clear indications, like mud carefully stuck to the door on the passenger side, a unique parking sticker with a horn design on the window, and a noticeable political sticker on the back tire cover. We were able to conclude that it was, in fact, uh, the the suspect's Jeep. Comparing these findings to the photographs of Christopher's Jeep taken by the police on the day of the attack, it became clear that all the pieces fit together seamlessly. Another challenge arose for the investigators, as they lacked concrete evidence that it was Christopher who drove the yellow Jeep that night. In such a crucial case, every detail had to be scrutinized. They closely examined the photos of Christopher's Jeep, and discovered a significant clue, an easy pass-like tag stuck on the floor. The yellow Jeep was searched for blood and or bloody clothing, any type of blood transfer whatsoever, which would be indicative of the attack. There was no, no blood located in the vehicle whatsoever. The investigators thought there could be a possibility 
that Christopher may have intentionally paid the highway tolls in cash, cleverly avoiding leaving any trace or means to track his movements. They tell me if you take it off a windshield and you get it down on the floor and, or, you know, put it away somewhere as it won't register. Basically on toll roads, such as the thruway, there are multiple exits, and the amount you need to pay depends on how far you travel. When you enter the toll road, the attendant gives you a ticket. When you reach your exit, you insert the ticket into a slot, and it shows you the amount you have to pay based on the distance you traveled. Around the time when Christopher crossed the toll booth, only about 12 cars passed through. The investigators collected all 12 toll tickets and sent them to the forensic lab for testing and analysis. Those 12 toll tickets to the forensic lab for testing. What we were looking for were any kind of skin cells. If your hands are sweaty and you touch a toll ticket, there's a possibility that DNA sources such as epithelial cells may be transferred onto these toll tickets. However, the investigators found no fingerprints or DNA evidence on the toll tickets, which left them at a dead end. It seemed likely that they wouldn't be able to prove that Christopher was the one who drove the Jeep to Porco's home and carried out the attack. When that DNA came in, that was the top of the mountain. It was what I considered a mountain of circumstantial evidence. You would expect to see that sequence in 0.04% of the population. But with the rest of the evidence they had against Christopher, the investigators were confident that he was the individual who had passed through the toll booth and who arrived at Porco's home on the night of the murder to carry out the attack. With these pieces of evidence, the investigators were certain of Christopher's involvement in the crime. Almost a whole year after the attack, on November 4, 2005, Christopher was charged with the murder of his father and attempted murder of his mother based on the gathered information. However, what happened next wasn't out of character. Christopher admitted that the yellow Jeep seen in the surveillance video was indeed his, but he claimed that he was only moving it to park off campus. According to him, when he returned to the dorm lounge, his frat brothers had already gone to sleep. Christopher argued that the surveillance cameras on campus only showed him leaving the campus, not specifically going home or to the thruway. He questioned the logic of using a conspicuous yellow Jeep, if he had malicious intentions. The surveillance video, according to Christopher, did not provide evidence of his destination. Van Sant, Christopher's attorney, told investigator McDermott that while the video confirmed his departure from campus, it did not reveal where he actually went. McDermott pointed out the crucial testimony of Marshall Gokey, who saw Christopher's Jeep in the Porco's driveway at 4 a.m. McDermott firmly believed that it was indeed Christopher's vehicle. This indicated that Christopher was present at the Porco home during the time of the attack. When considering the combined evidence of Marshall Gokey's testimony, the surveillance videos, the toll taker's records, and the knowledge required to deactivate the alarm using master codes, McDermott concluded that Marshall Gokey's account perfectly aligned with the rest of the evidence, strengthening the case against Christopher. Finally, Joan Porco, the key witness, also revealed that she had no memory of the events from that night and did not recall nodding to indicate her son as the attacker. In a surprising move, Joan publicly declared her son's innocence, challenging the prosecution's entire case against him. In the trial, Jonathan Porco was also present, and he expressed his anger towards Christopher for taking away his father's life. The police claimed that Joan identified her son as the killer by nodding. However, the defense team argues that the prosecution's case was weak because there was no forensic evidence connecting Chris to the crime. According to the defense, there was no bloody footprints or fingerprints that tied Chris to the scene, and no forensic evidence was found in his Jeep. According to Terry Kinlan, the defense attorney, the surveillance video was not a concern. He explained that Christopher parked his Jeep off campus and then wandered around until later in the morning, around 3.30 a.m., when he returned to the dorm lounge and fell asleep. Kinlan stated that he knew why the alarm at the Porco's house was deactivated, using the master code. He claimed that Peter Porco had a habit of disabling the alarm to let the dog go out and sometimes even forgot to reactivate it. A month after being charged, Christopher was released on bail with the support of his family and friends, who strongly believed in his innocence. During this time, he stayed with Elaine Lafort, 
a veterinarian whom Christopher had worked with for a long time. Elaine considered Christopher like a son to her. Nineteen months after the savage attack that tragically took Peter's life and forever changed Joan's existence, on June 27, 2006, the trial commenced. It was heartbreaking to see that Joan entered the courtroom alongside the man accused of committing this violent crime, her own son, Christopher. The courtroom became a battleground as the prosecution and defense engaged in a seven-week-long struggle, presenting the bloody details of this circumstantial case. Over 80 witnesses testified, shedding light on the events surrounding the tragic incident. Paramedics Kevin Robert and Dennis Wood stated that they observed Joan Porco nodding when they asked her if Christopher was the one who attacked her. However, Joan's neurologist, Dr. Mary Dumbavi, informed the jurors that it was unlikely for Joan to fully comprehend the questions due to her severe injuries. The prosecution challenged Christopher's alibi by summoning nine of his frat brothers as witnesses. Rossi, one of the investigators, testified that they brought in everyone who was present in the lounge that night, and all of them confirmed that Porco was not there. To determine if Christopher drove to Porco's home, the jurors heard testimonies from the two toll collectors, who recalled seeing a yellow Jeep similar to Christopher's on the night of the murder. Additionally, neighbor Marshall Goki shared his account of spotting Christopher's Jeep on the morning of the attack. On the other hand, a forensic pathologist reminded the jury that there was no trace of blood from the crime scene found on Christopher. However, the prosecutors provided explanations for this. They believed that Christopher probably did not get much blood on him during the crime. They also noted that Christopher had enough time inside the house to change his clothes. Moreover, they pointed out that Christopher worked in a veterinary hospital and has been trained to avoid contamination. Defense attorney Shanks strongly disagreed with the prosecution's claims. He argued that it went against common sense. If someone repeatedly strikes another person with an axe for 15 to 20 times, it was expected that blood would be present on the attacker. Shanks asserted that the lack of blood on Christopher was evidence that he did not commit the crime. When asked about his thoughts on trial, Christopher expressed optimism about the progress and the outcome regarding his guilt or innocence. Even though he decided not to testify, he wanted to convey a message to the jury. He urged them not to rush to conclusions and to carefully consider all the evidence. Christopher believed that when they examined the entire picture, they would see that things didn't make sense and his innocence would become apparent. After a lengthy seven-week trial, both the prosecution and the defense anticipated a prolonged deliberation by the jury. However, to their surprise, the jury reached a unanimous verdict in less than six hours on August 10, 2006. Christopher was found guilty of all charges. On December 12, 2006, Judge Jeffrey Berry sentenced Porco to 50 years to life on each count, totaling a minimum of 50 years in prison. Christopher would be eligible for parole in 2052. When the verdict was announced, Christopher remained emotionless. When asked about it, he explained that he was advised by his attorney not to show much emotion, regardless of the outcome. Joan unfortunately arrived too late to hear the verdict regarding her son's fate. When Christopher and his attorney sat down, his first request to the attorney was for her to inform his mother about the verdict. Christopher was visibly upset. However, by the time they returned to the hotel, someone had already informed his mother. The attorney met with Joan, who was overwhelmed with devastation upon hearing the news. According to the prosecutor David Rossi, Christopher believed he was cleverer than everyone else when he committed the crime. However, he was mistaken in thinking it was a flawless plan. The guilty verdict, although adding more sorrow to Joan Porco's life, ensured that justice was served. After 16 long years, an interview was finally arranged with Christopher Porco to discuss the case and verdict. It was a challenging process to gain access to the prison and conduct the interview, but finally in early 2023, the opportunity arose. The interviewer had two hours to ask Christopher Porco various questions, but the most depressing one was the first. Did he commit the heinous crime he was just convicted of? During the interview, Christopher Porco shared his experience of the past 16 years. Yeah, I'll ask you the obvious question again, Chris. Did, did you do this crime? I didn't. I had nothing to do with this. Um, I've said that from day one, and it's the truth.
reflecting on his life behind bars and offering his thoughts on the case that had consumed his existence. Weeks go by very quickly, and so it's easy for years to kind of go by too. You know, when you think about what's happened in the past 16 years outside of here, um, you know, George Bush was president when I got here, so. <laughs> right. Christopher's smile vanished as he discussed the trial, revealing his perspective on the moment he pleaded guilty. Christopher's new attorney, Danielle Muscatello from Barkett Epstein in New York City, was seeking the attention of another judge. People of the state of New York against Christopher Porco, count one, murder in the second degree. What's your verdict? Guilty. I think we were overconfident, I would say, going in um, and felt like there just wasn't enough evidence and can kind of rely on that. Having said that, a criminal trial is as much about narrative as it is about evidence. And I got to hand it to the prosecution in my case. They, they told a wonderful story. I don't blame the police for initially suspecting me. Um, I don't blame them for prosecuting me, even though they knew there were real problems with the case. She planned to file a 440 motion, a legal argument requesting the criminal court to reconsider the verdict from years ago and re-examine the Christopher Porco case thoroughly. In order for Christopher to have done this, uh, which we of course adamantly maintain that he did not, um, he, he would have had to completed these heinous acts in a very, very narrow time span. Um, and what his attorneys failed to do is they failed to break that down. And when you break it down piece by piece, it doesn't fit. And it doesn't fit because it didn't happen. One thing that was evident from talking to Christopher Porco in prison was that his mother remained his staunchest supporter. The final question posed to Christopher was whether, in the event of a new trial and the prosecution's desire to avoid further proceedings, he would be willing to plead guilty to the attack in exchange for being released with credit for time served. Somebody, either in the DA's office or high up in the Bethlehem Police Department, realized that they didn't have a warrant for information that they believe was going to be critical. Porco's lawyers will have to wait for several months to find out if their legal strategy was successful. In the meantime, Porco is currently serving his 17th year of a 50 year to life well, sentence. It sounds like your mom is still very much in your corner and- uh, Very much. She's the toughest person you'll ever meet. Uh, we speak every day. Um, she has borne the brunt of this without a doubt. So we, we've gotten through this together really. Um, we're the support system for each other, but she's endured much more than I ever will. Despite years behind bars, Christopher's guilt or innocence continues to be a subject of debate. What are your thoughts on this case? Was it Christopher who attacked Peter and Joan Porco or someone else? We'd love to hear from you. If there's a case you'd like us to cover, don't hesitate to drop your recommendations in the comments section below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more captivating true crime stories. Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled for the next mystery to unfold.